What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. Today I've got a very special guest for you, a SWAT paramedic who also has his own YouTube channel by the name of Prep Medic. And he made us a video covering TCCC, Tactical Combat Casualty Care. And this is the important stuff, guys. It's actually a full day or even a multi-day course that he was able to condense down into this one video for you. So once you finish this entire video, head over to Prep Medic's profile and give him a sub as well. So enjoy, guys. Hey guys, my name's Sam, and today we're gonna to be discussing bleeding control for law enforcement officers. It is pretty well known that law enforcement officers experience life-threatening situations every day on the job. Now, bleeding control is super important because it is one of the leading causes of preventable death in combat situations. Law enforcement academies do a very good job at teaching defensive tactics, shooting drills, and hand-to-hand -hand combat. But one thing that is oftentimes looked over is first aid and bleeding control, which is why this video is so important. The first thing we need to talk about is what equipment you need to carry on you. It is not good enough to keep your tourniquet or your packing gauze in your car. It's not good enough to be relying on EMS because we all know they will take a while to get into the scene if there's a violent situation going on. So you need to have this on your duty gear that you wear every single day. The first thing that you should be keeping on you is going to be a tourniquet. So I recommend, and I use the cat tourniquet. This is from North American Rescue, but there are several uh, TECC approved or Committee for Tactical Combat Casualty Care approved tourniquets that you can be using. The second thing you should have on you is some kind of packing gauze. Now, your hemostatic agents, such as combat gauze are great. This is quick clot. You pack this into the wound and it's going to release an agent that helps the clotting process begin. This product is a little bit expensive though. So if you cannot afford the $25 for this combat gauze, then you can also get plain packing gauze. This is about $3. The studies between these two have shown that this does stop bleeding faster. However, it has no change in mortality or morbidity down the line over regular packing gauze. So you've got the equipment that you need. Now we have to talk about how you store it on your persons. Ideally, we wanna keep a tourniquet stored within our diver's triangle. So that's a triangle that's made across the clavicles down to your belt buckle. And if you have it in this area, it is easily accessible by both hands. Now, if you put it on your belt and it's a little bit off to the side, that's fine so long as you can reach it with either hand mainly because if you get shot in one arm, you have to be able to reach it with the other in a very stressful environment. There is a correct way to store a tourniquet that's going to make it much easier for you to deploy. So this is the correct way to have a tourniquet stored. You can see that I have the time tab off to the side. If you wanna take this and you wanna just inch it forward so that's easy to grab, that's great. But you should never have this all the way across your windlass even though it looks a little bit more smooth simply because when you're in a stressful situation, you've been shot, your buddy's been shot, somebody else has been shot, you cannot be fumbling around with this. It is very hard to get off when you are extremely uh, stressed out. Now, the other thing I see all the time is that how we have these tourniquets accordioned into each other. So with this, I have to be able to come in here and pull this out and have it at the biggest setting possible. So for self-aid, I have to be able to get that around my arm or my leg. So when I come over here to this tourniquet, I can open it up and it's a really big loop, really easy to apply to somebody. This one here, it's cinched all the way down. It's not accordioned and it's not going to work quite as well. So now that we've discussed the equipment to carry and where to keep it on your gear, we need to talk about what you should actually be doing in a combat situation. So in direct threat care, when somebody is actively attacking you, still shooting at you, the best thing you can do is neutralize that threat as fast as possible. While that's going on, the person that is shot or injured should attempt to move to cover. If you are the person that is engaging the threat and there's somebody down in front of you, you should encourage them to self-rescue, get out of that situation. If we can avoid putting ourselves in harm's way to get them, that is the best case scenario. 
So you should encourage them to move to cover and then have them self-apply the tourniquet if applicable. Now, tourniquet application is the only intervention we should be doing in direct threat care because we have more pressing matters. And if we're getting shot because we are doing first aid on somebody else, that's not doing anybody any good. So you can apply a tourniquet if you have good cover, but remember to keep that offensive and to neutralize the threat. So to place a tourniquet, it's a couple really easy steps. Number one, we need to get it on the limb. Once we put it on the limb, if we can see where the injury is and it's bright red arterial bleeding spurting out of the wound, then we want to take it and put it two to three inches above the wound, making sure not to put it across a joint. If we don't know where it's coming from or we're not entirely sure, high and tight is the way to go. Put it all the way up the arm or the leg, tighten it down. Now, when you're putting it on, the first and most important step of that is to take it and try to ratchet it down as tight as you can get with the Velcro. That first initial tightening is going to make it the most effective down the line. Once you have it completely tightened, you kind of let that strap hang down and you're going to start tightening the windlass. You're going to tighten the windlass until all the bleeding has stopped. Periodically, about 10% of the time, one tourniquet is not going to stop the bleeding and you'll have to apply a second tourniquet above the wound. Remember that if you're in a resource limited environment, it's you and one other officer, or maybe it's just you, you are not out of the fight because you have a tourniquet in place. You can stay engaged on the target and make sure you're defending yourself in those situations. Once the threat has been neutralized or the victim has been moved into a more secure location, this is when we go into indirect threat care. So in indirect threat care, we're going to reassess our bleeding and we're gonna start going down our March algorithm, which there's plenty of great videos on the internet about the March algorithm. As we go down this, we're gonna reassess for major bleeding. In this case, we're gonna look. If we have a tourniquet in place, we're gonna see if that is effective. If the patient has been injured in a junctional site, so base of the neck, armpit, or groin, we can pack the wound. So wound packing is kind of this scary intervention that we don't ever really want to do, but it's really important that we understand the method for doing it. In this case, I have a piece of silicone gel that's going to demonstrate the wound packing. Like I said, this is only used at your junctional areas, so base of neck, armpit, and groin where a tourniquet cannot be applied. In these cases, we can use packing gauze, and this is the quick clot that I was talking about before. The gauze I'm using for this demonstration is just plain Z-fold gauze. So in this case, what we do is we're going to take this. If it's easier, you can take this and you can put it in your shirt so that it spools out as you pack the wound. I like just throwing it over my shoulder. It's a little bit easier. Now in this case, we have a bullet hole. We'll do this one here. Um, and what you wanna do is you wanna create a little ball at the end and you wanna take this and put it into the wound and try to direct it as close to the bleeding as you can. Put it right up against the wall of the artery. As we continue to go, we're going to just alternate fingers one at a time until that wound is completely full. And you'll see that you can actually compress the tissue pretty far to get a lot of this gauze in. Once that's there, we're going to take it and we're gonna hold direct pressure. Now, hopefully we're in a situation where we can hold this pressure for at least three minutes. In actuality, we're gonna hold this pressure for as long as we can. If we're still in a semi-unsafe environment, we can take a pressure bandage or take the rest of this gauze and wrap it tight into the wound. Just be aware that the most effective thing to do is to hold direct pinpoint pressure on that wound to keep the artery from bleeding. It is really important to be aware that this is not something that should be done while there is an active threat, while you are in immediate danger of being shot. There have been multiple officers that have been attempting to render aid on patients while there has still been an active threat and they have been injured because of it. That is just a quick rundown of tactical emergency casualty care. Obviously, there's a lot more that goes into medical care in the austere environment. If you're interested in learning more about tactical emergency casualty care, TCCC, and other life-saving procedures, you can follow me on YouTube at Prep Medic or on Instagram, Prep underscore Medic. Huge shout out to Iron Infidel for bringing me on for this video project, and I will see you guys later.